I'm afraid I did something that I'm guilty of on occasion, and that was I confused you with my email to you today. Some of you did read the email. Some of you didn't. Um, there is a notable quote due in section, in section this week, and I want you to disregard my email. That's the first and only time I will tell you that. Disregard my email. The notable quote should be on two of the three readings due this week. There's one that's um, on the internet, and another, and two of them in the um, in the reader. Okay. You pick. How about just the ones in the reader? Just the two in the reader. The one on the internet is really just meant to be um, informational. Who has the time? One is on the internet. And two are, there are two articles in the reader. Hello. Okay, how are you? No, I was just making some announcements. Good to see you. It's been a long time. What, a year? Yes. Okay, just to clarify, reader 9 and reader 10. Better? You're welcome. Reader 9 is the Armenian Genocide Context and Legacy. And reader 10 is Robert Melson, the Armenian Genocide as Precursor and Prototype of 20th Century Genocide. And what's meant by that title is that if we look at the Armenian Genocide, we might very well, in fact, we are able to understand about uh, 20th century genocide. Hello, I'm Stefan Asturian. Myrna Goodman. Nice, nice to meet, to meet you, you, Stefan. Why don't you uh, I, get yourself it's... comfortable? Yeah. yeah okay. I, don't, I don't think I need a DC here. You know, it's cold where I am. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Over in Berkeley. Yeah. I'll introduce yeah. you. Let me write a few things on the backbone. Um, That's fine. Um, Christine has uh, uh, two maps. That's great. Oh, fantastic. Is that good? Okay. Yeah, I think it's good. Okay, so yeah, if you'll give me a yeah. chance, I'll yeah. properly yeah. introduce you. Okay. Barry Preisler was, uh, spoke very highly. Really? Yeah, he exaggerated. I'm sure he doesn't. He doesn't. Okay. Um, We've had a little bit of a change in, the, in um, our uh, lecture for today. Um, I am very, very pleased that someone who is as notable as Dr. Um, Astorian agreed 
to come and lecture for us. And I hope it's the first time in, in what might be a, a series of years when he might lecture for us. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce him, Dr. Stephen Stefan. Astorian is the executive director of the Armenian Studies Program at UC Berkeley. He is also the William Soroyan Adjunct Assistant Professor in Armenian and Caucasian History in the Department of History at UCB. Professor, Professor Asturian was born in France, where he went through the rigorous training of elite preparatory classes uh, and eventually, um, through examination, received his um, BA from the Sorbonne at the University of Paris. Uh, he then pursued his graduate studies there and eventually earned an MA and um, the equivalent of a PhD. Um, and then his interest in, the modern, in modern Armenian history led him to move to UCLA where he earned a second MA and completed his PhD in modern Armenian and Caucasian history. Um, he's the treasurer of the executive council of the Society for Armenian Studies. Uh, his publications include, or his writing, includes being editor-in-chief of the UCLA Jusur, the UCLA Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, and he's authored about 20 articles and essays on modern Armenia, Ottoman, Ottoman Republic, and Azerbaijani history, as well as on post-Soviet Caucasian pol politics. It's a big mouthful for me. Um, he has um, um, some writing that is due to forthcoming silence, the silence of the land, agrarian relations, ethnicity, and power, which will appear in A Question of Genocide, 1915, Armenians and Turks at the end of the Ottoman Empire. He also has another uh, long list of publications. And he is currently completing the manuscript of a book on the origins of the Armenian Genocide using sources written in eight languages and archival materials from a half a dozen countries. Obviously, we have um, the great honor to have Dr. Asturian here to talk to us, and I introduce him to you now. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Goodman, and I am uh, pleased to be uh, giving a lecture today at the Center for Holocaust and uh, Genocide Studies. Uh, prior uh, to starting, I would like, uh, because I'm not uh, sure whether you have a general idea of uh, uh, historic Armenia, the population that lived there, and so on. So maybe I should start with a kind of uh, description of what we are talking about, the region we are talking about, the type of people living there. Uh, I would like also to ask you whether, uh, especially the students, whether uh, uh, you have taken a class in uh, modern uh, Middle Eastern history. That is, when I refer to something like the Tanzimat in the Ottoman Empire, whether it makes sense to you or whether it's a total, uh, it's a world, you know? Uh, like that, I can adjust what I am saying accordingly uh, when I refer to terms like this one. Who has taken a course in Middle Eastern um, history here? Okay, so I will have to basically uh, describe things that uh, I might not uh, in um, uh, some uh, other context. Uh, that is good to know. So the region we will be talking about today is uh, historic Armenia. Uh, it describes the area where Armenians uh, had been living uh, for about 25 centuries at the time of the genocide. The first attested reference to Armenians as a, a group of people appears in the 6th century uh, BC in Greek and Persian sources. Uh, the region we will be talking about is the region uh, stretching from, you see Erzurum there, just outside the square, hmm? Erzurum, okay, going towards Kabizon near the Black Sea coast 
going further south here to uh, the other here, turning right to the south of Lake Van and uh, reaching almost the lake of Umia. This is historic Armenia, stretching from what you see that is Yerevan and the current Armenian Republic to all of this area here, going to uh, Lake Umia and up. The heart of it historically uh, was the region around Lake Van. You know, that's the heart of historic Armenia, where most of the major uh, cultural life and so on of uh, kingdoms, principalities, uh, survive. Second thing that you should know about, because I will be referring uh, in passing to the Adana massacres, and it thus happens that uh, next month, uh, it's the uh, uh, 90th, uh, no, 100th anniversary, uh, centenary of the Adana massacres, and there will be a series of conferences. The first one is in Armenia, I will be there next month. Uh, the region of Adana here, near the uh, Mediterranean Sea. The region stretching from uh, Mersin to Adana, further up to Gaziantep, and coming back here, just above Aleppo, that's the town of Iskenderun on the Black Sea coast, uh, in the Gulf of Iskenderun or Alexandretta, is the region known historically as Cilicia. Not Silesia, like uh, what was in Europe, but Silesia with a C, uh, two Cs. Uh, that region was also heavily Armenian uh, populated in the Ottoman Empire uh, and constituted a second uh, area where Armenians were heavily concentrated. Uh, outside those two regions, you had Armenians all over the place, in places like Kayseri, a few in Ankara, my own family uh, came from the district of Konya, which is outside historic Armenia, and you had lots of Armenians in the capital of the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul, then referred to as Constantinople uh, in the 19th century. I will be talking about the origins of the Armenian question and how they evolved into a gen genocidal process. So I will be referring mostly to this region here, historic Armenia, also referred to as Eastern Anatolia. That region uh, in the 19th century was predominantly uh, inhabited by Kurds and Armenians. Turkish population in that area didn't constitute 20% of the overall population. The main characteristic of the Armenians were, uh, was that they were essentially a sedentary population. They are farmers. Uh, the overwhelming majority of them uh, are farmers. And they uh, are in cities, they are craftspeople, uh, local merchants, or regional merchants. Okay? That's a profile. You found Turks only in some of the cities of Eastern Anatolia, the Albekir, the room, and so on. There are a few that are not there. Uh, they constituted usually the class of uh, uh, state officials, uh, sometimes uh, local notables, okay? uh, but you didn't have Turks living in that area. The, over, the bulk of the population was Kurdish, and the Kurdish population was predominantly pastoral nomadic, okay? That is, these are people uh, who uh, are not sedentary, they move around. Hmm? In the spring, they start going up the hill with their uh, flocks, you know, of sheep or goats or whatever they are, okay? Then they come back in the fall and uh, go down, uh, and I'll tell you how uh, they live. Pastoral nomadic Kurds and some of the Kurds in the 19th century were uh, semi-sedentary. Some of them had, were undergoing a process of sedentarization. That is, they were uh, being uh, forcibly settled as a result of the policies of the Ottoman state. Hmm? The main characteristic of the Kurdish population, then I will deal with that uh, in the course of my lecture, uh, interspersing uh, comments when I feel that I should add them to what I had to say. Now, 
Today's topic is the Armenian genocidal process and the Young Turks. Uh, the Young Turks took power in 1908 in the Ottoman Empire. Prior to that, for most of the period I will be talking about, we were dealing with a sultan whose name was Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Okay? Uh, he took power uh, at, the end, uh, in the, at the end of the 1870s uh, and stayed in power up to 1909. The period preceding Sultan Abdul Hamid, stretching from 1839 to effectively 1876, even though in some textbooks you see uh, 1878, is the period known as the period of the Tanzimat, T-A-N-Z-I-M-A-T. The period of the Tanzimat is a period of reform. Tanzimat means uh, reorganization, approximately. Uh, it was a period when a small group of Ottoman leaders, partly westernized, people who had spent some time in the Ottoman embassies of London, Paris, or Berlin, okay, had returned to the Ottoman Empire and realizing that the Ottoman Empire was in bad shape, had tried to enact, uh, introduce some reforms to be able to hold together an empire that stretched from almost Algeria, which is located there, you know, in North Africa, okay, to all over around the uh, Mediterranean Sea, going up to Albania. Okay, so we are talking, when we talk about the Ottoman Empire, we are referring to a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional empire, okay, with people, uh, Armenians, Kurds, these are Indo-Europeans, Arabs, Jews, Semitic languages, Albanians, uh, Serbs, uh, Bulgarians, uh, Cyrillic languages, Bulgarians, Serbs, and so on. Uh, and I can go on for uh, uh, half an hour on uh, the describing every single group. Okay. That empire, and that will be my final comment as a background to my lecture, uh, was losing ground in the 19th century. And the whole history of the 19th century for the Ottoman Empire is a history of continuous territorial losses Okay, starting in the Balkans, in the European section of the Ottoman Empire, and uh, then uh, reaching also the Middle uh, East, areas like uh, Tunisia in North Africa, or Egypt that became respectively French and British protectorates, you know, uh, but were already under influence of those countries you know, uh, prior to that, uh, as early as the 1880s. Lebanon was theoretically part of the Ottoman Empire, but as early as the 1850s, French and British felt that they could have a say in what was going on in uh, Lebanon. Lebanon, you see it, it's right in front of your eyes here. Now, if you read the books, about uh, what happened to the Armenians, uh, you see a reference to the Armenian question. So my first point is that we must start with uh, a question. What is the Armenian question, basically? Uh, Armenian or non-Armenian academic historiography tends to portray it as a diplomatic history, that is, attempts by uh, Europeans to introduce reforms to protect the life and properties of the Armenians in historic Armenia. Okay. Usually the narrative will start with the Treaty of San Stefano, early 1878, which marked the end of a Turkish or uh, Ottoman-Russian war. will continue with the Treaty of Berlin in the summer of 1878, and we'll refer to various articles dealing with the Armenians. The only problem I would uh, suspect is that those European, uh, the European intervention 
was not the Armenian question, it was the result of the Armenian question. Okay? It was the consequence of it. So uh, dealing with diplomatic history ad nauseam, as some people have done, uh, doesn't even touch the reality of the problem. That's my first comment. The second comment is that Armenian uh, communal historiography, by communal historiography I'm referring to people with uh, some substantial education uh, who have written books sometimes, uh, 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 tends to portray the Armenian question as uh, one stage in the long struggle, the, pre, uh, the supposed long struggle of the Armenian nation for independence. It tends to portray it as uh, a moment in which Armenians couldn't put up anymore with uh, centuries of Ottoman uh, persecution. The fact of the matter is that uh, there were not uh, centuries of Ottoman persecutions. Okay? The Ottoman Empire in the 16th century or uh, 17th century was not a paradise but compared with uh, the European states existing at that time was a relatively tolerant empire in comparative terms, not in modern terms, in modern terms it's not, but by the standards of that time, you know, compared with uh, the French kingdom, for example, where uh, they like to defenestrate Protestants or to bludgeon them to death and so on, uh, it was a uh, tolerant uh, empire by the standards of that time. That's where I am uh, stressing the issue. So the problem is to find out why in the 19th century the same cannot apply. You know, it's no more a tolerant empire. And the closer you get to the 20th century, the more rabid uh, the hatred towards minority, minorities uh, turns. Second point about this type of communal historiography and so on is the idea of a long struggle for independence and so on. Uh, that is, uh, as a matter of fact, more or less uh, a fantasy when we look uh, at uh, modern uh, history. Okay? Uh, the last Armenian kingdom, independent kingdom, ended in 1375. So Armenians had statehood of various types for over uh, about uh, uh, independent statehoods from uh, essentially the 4th century, the end of the 4th century to the 14th century. Prior to that, they had quasi-independent statehood uh, in historic Armenia uh, as early as the middle of the 6th century. And there were periods without statehood also, but continuously, approximately continuously, with a few interruptions, you know, a long tradition of uh, statehood in the form of kingdoms or uh, quasi-autonomous or independent uh, principalities. Third comment, Turkish historiography, uh, which in its essence until about seven, ten years ago, is a semi-official historiography, nationalistic historiography, directed by the equivalent of the American Historical Association. The only problem is that it is not like the American Historical Association, it's the Turkish Historical Society, and there uh, you uh, don't write whatever you want when the topics deal with Kurds, Armenians, and so on. You know, you follow the line. Okay. So, Turkish semi-official nationalistic historiography argued that what happened to the Armenians has to be understood as a, a process, a phenomenon that basically was similar to what happened to Balkan nationalism. Armenians tried to follow, they say, the example of Balkan nationalists, Bulgarians, Greeks, uh, Serbs, and so on. Uh, they wanted to dismember the empire, okay, to proclaim independence, in the area that I have uh, described, and they tried to do that by appealing to the European powers to get independence uh, in the, the future. This type of historiography is also a kind of mirrors, it mirrors Armenian communal uh, historiography, 
because it is also a pure uh, fantasy in its uh, main statements. Last characteristic of the current state of historiography is the fact that uh, you can read about anything now with the exception of a couple of articles uh, actually. Uh, and you will find out that the Armenian question and the Armenian genocide seems to be happening in a social, economic, and cultural void. That is, it's as if it is happening in an abstract society where people kill people, but there is no under, underlying social reality. Okay? Much of the historiography by some famous uh, scholars is like a kind of detective work, that is, who played what role, uh, uh, when uh, did this guy decide to do that. Uh, it is that type of historiography. And the underlying social, economic, cultural realities, which also tended to differ between Eastern Anatolia or historic Armenia and Cilicia, for example, uh, those differences are glossed over and they uh, basically don't exist. In a nutshell, if we want to understand what went on at that time, we have to understand uh, uh, what the dynamic between those ethnic uh, religious groups uh, was. We need a social, economic, cultural, polit political contextualization of the Armenian question to better understand why a group of people, the Armenians, who were known at the turn of the 19th century as the Mileti Sadaka in Ottoman, which means the loyal Millet, okay? They were viewed as the gr good group of people, you know, reliable, unlike the Greeks, unlike the Jews, you know, Armenians were the nice folks, loyal, okay? Why that group of people by the end of the 19th century was uh, essentially the target of systematic persecutions and was most likely the most hated uh, minority group in the Ottoman Empire. So we need to ask what took place between those two periods, beginning and end of the 19th century. The first part of my lecture is uh, the origins of the Armenian question, a triangular problem. By triangular, I mean, I mean uh, that it pertained to Armenians, Kurds, and the Ottoman state. That is the origin of the Armenian question. The Armenian question starts as an agrarian problem, uh, which evolved into a political issue in the context of the reforms of the Tanzimat era that I mentioned a few minutes ago. You must realize that uh, in the first half of the 19th century, huge parts of the Ottoman Empire were only nominally under the control of the state. They were part of the Ottoman Empire, but effectively the Ottoman state had very little control in those areas. Okay? One of those areas was precisely historic Armenia or Eastern Anatolia. In name, the region was part of the Ottoman Empire, but effectively, Turkish officials had very little control in that region. As a matter of fact, that region had been governed for quite uh, several decades by various Kurdish emirs, that is, uh, lords or uh, commanders, you know. And uh, in 1840, one particularly able emir, his name is Bedr Khan, Khan is also a title, K-H-A-N, you know, Bedr Khan, from a famous family which is referred to as the Bedr Khanid family. It has descendants up to now, by the way. Okay? This gentleman was able to take over the whole region stretching from Lake Van. You see Lake Van just in the bottom of the square there? Okay? To Yarbekir. Parts of northern Iraq, always in the news, northern Iraq, yeah, yeah, near Mosul, and stretching to Lake Ubi. So that whole region uh, around Lake Van, going down to Yarbekir, almost to Mosul, and going up to Lake Umia and back, was effectively under the control of uh, Emir uh, Bedr Khan. 
It is the destruction of that emirate in 1847 under European pressure, uh, British and French, because that better Khan had uh, at some point decided to massacre some local uh, Christians, non, not Armenians. Uh, uh, that led to the overall anarchy and oppression of the Armenians in the eastern provinces. Bedar Khan had been able to establish uh, control in that territory, stretching from Bitlis to Mosul, uh, from Diyarbakir to Urnia, and he had been able, uh, which is very unusual, to bring law and order in that whole area. Armenians were paying tax to him, and whatever we know about that period tends to suggest that Bedar Khan looked upon the Armenians as a very useful population for his emirate, an enterprising population, more educated, active, uh, you know, farmers, traders, and so on. And we are not aware of cases of persecution of Armenians under his leadership. To the uh, contrary. The Emirate of Bedar Khan was destroyed in 1847 as a result of European pressures and the expedition of the uh, Ottoman army. And as a result of that, what happened in eastern Anatolia in that region and even north of Lake Van was a process of splintering of the Kurdish political order into little tribes and uh, taking control of smaller parts of the territory. At the same time, those tribes were essentially fighting against one another. And in that context, a particular group of people emerged as the power brokers. And these were the sheikhs, the leaders of Sufi Islamic orders. Why did they emerge as leaders? For the simple reason because that those sheikhs, because of religion, could transcend their tribal affiliation. They were the only people who could cross over, you know, okay, uh, and deal with another tribe, even though they were part of tribe A, let's say, okay. The families of the tribal chieftains and uh, sheikhs intermarried, and uh, quite primitive uh, Sufi orders ended up uh, playing a very significant role in that region. By the way, for those of you who follow the news and so on about Iraq, uh, even though it's less trendy now with the economic uh, technical problems we are facing, uh, uh, the two main uh, Kurdish leaders in Iraq, the current president, Talibani, and uh, the gentleman who is the leader of the uh, region of Kurdistan in the north, uh, Mr. Barzani, uh, both of them belong to famous Kurdish families, but both of them are also members of Sufi orders up to now and come from leadership families of the Sufi orders. That is, the Kurdish political system is deeply embedded with you know, this type of affiliation. As a result of the splintering of the Kurdish political order, there emerged a phenomenon of fanaticism against minorities, intertribal conflict, sporadic yet continuous approximately violence toward Christian population, and what will turn out to be the main problem, that is massive land usurpation. As a result of, uh, of the Armenians, of course. Okay? As a result of land usurpation, they will uh, ensure a phenomenon of exodus from uh, historic Armenia, of populations that turn into uh, sort of uh, refugee populations in major cities uh, or males leaving the area and turning into what is known as bantuchts, you know, and doing menial jobs in Istanbul and other places. This phenomenon of land usurpation, which had its origins in the local evolution of the Kurdish order, combined uh, in the Ottoman Empire with a particular reform of the Tanzimat era, the so-called Land Code of 1858, okay? And that Land Code of 1858 is extremely complex. There are many opinions by, by, by historians about it, and its application uh, from region to region varied. Okay? 
That is, Ottoman law was a little bit like the Soviet constitution. It was beautiful, but on paper. The reality was slightly different, you know. Uh, the main idea of the land code of 1858 is that it gave opportunity to people, basically, in the medium run, to become owners of lands that prior to that were theoretically state lands. So the usurpation of Armenian lands coincided with an opportunity of taking over, you know, uh, once and for all, what belonged to that uh, peasantry. And it, of course, intensified the process of land usurpation. Local sheikhs, Kurdish notables or chieftains, Turkish provincial notables saw a magnificent opportunity, okay, to basically take over, you know, property, drive out those minorities, all the more so since the Tanzimat reform introduced by those westernized Ottoman leaders were hated in the provinces. Hated. There was hatred towards those reforms because the main goal of the reforms was to centralize the empire. Those provincial notables, Kurdish chieftains, they didn't like that. The second goal of the reform was to promulgate equality for all Ottoman subjects, be they Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. This didn't sit well at all with uh, the people in the eastern uh, provinces, and they looked at those reforms as being essentially advantageous to minorities, and for them it was very important to break the back of those minorities who were under their control and were powerless. The Ottoman legal system was also a particular system when you wanted to go to court and say, gee, you know, Professor Goodman just took over my home, my garden, my two dogs, and so on. I said, uh, you know, uh, you have to go to an Islamic court. And uh, let's leave aside Professor Goodman. Let's say the gentleman is Ali or Mehmet. You know, he comes with two friends. And both of them swear that that is not the case, you know, and you have lost the trial. So in a nutshell, you have no legal recourse, you know, to solve your problems, you know? Okay. That is the gist of the Armenian question, land usurpation, and also underlying it something else. You know that the concept of property Anything can be your property. This might be my property. But within the idea of property, there is the idea of rights. Okay. So we are not basically talking about land here or houses and so on. There is the fact that in the Ottoman Empire, minorities, when push came to show, didn't have rights. No, you are deprived of rights. Okay. So it's not merely property rights, it's uh, if I am beaten up by my neighbor and so on, I go to court, I will lose it. There is no point. This reminds me of some of the current post-Soviet uh, republics where there is no reason to go to court and complain about somebody who takes over your apartment or uh, garden because most likely that guy is related to the government and you are losing your time even hiring a lawyer and going to court. You will never win. Okay? The legal system you know, <laughs> is not uh, open to all. So this is the gist of the Armenian question. And the second element that played a key role in bringing about this problem is the famous refugee problem and resettlement problem. I mentioned in passing that the history of 19th century Ottoman Empire was a history of territorial losses right and left. Concomitant with those territorial losses, actually even preceding them, was another phenomenon. The influx, it is estimated, of five to seven million, seven million Muslim refugees settling in Ottoman territories between 18, 1783 and 1940. At first, most of those refugees are Muslims from the Caucasus. The Caucasus, you see at the top of the map there, Caucasus Mountains. Actually, it's beautiful that they wrote it there because it is from that area that at first Muslims, as a result of various conflicts between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, are flocking 
into the friendly Ottoman Empire. They happen to be Muslims of the Sunni mm -hmm. brand of Islam, okay? And they go and settle either, either in the region of Bulgaria or Romania, which are outside the map to the north, eh? on the other side of the Black Sea, whoop, here, okay? Or some of them, as we'll see in the late 1850s and 1860s, will be resettled precisely in historic Armenia and to a fewer extent in the region of Cilicia, you know, that I mentioned earlier. Those people arrive, uh, just imagine, you know, it's good in history to imagine, to project yourself a little bit uh, in the shoes of those uh, people or in their mind if you can, you know. These are people who have lost everything and they have lost everything because of whom? Because of Christian powers, you know, the Russian Empire, okay, or when uh, Serbia, Bulgaria become independent or autonomous and so on. These are again Christians hmm? and those populations are fleeing, are turning into refugees. Those who are resettled in Anatolia or in Cilicia, they, can, they are extremely bitter, they are downtrodden. And they assimilate the local population, that is the Armenians, with the people who basically drove them out of their previous uh, locations. That is Russians, Bulgars, uh, Greeks, Serbs, uh, you name it, you know? Okay? So Armenians become a kind of target because unlike, let's say we are in the center of Holocaust and genocide studies, unlike Jews, Armenians and mostly unlike Ottoman Greeks, Armenians were essentially an agrarian population in the Ottoman Empire. I am often asked by uh, people who are sometimes scholars but don't know much, I must confess, you know, oh, well, why didn't the Ottoman exterminate the Jews? You know? Well, because Jews lived in a few cities, they were an urban population, you know, uh, and they were in a position totally dissimilar to that of the Armenians. Actually, in 1915, in the region of Syria, you know, and Lebanon, Jews were persecuted, but for political reason, it is not good to mention that these days, and uh, there is a totally different narrative about Ottoman Jewish relations. Uh, so the arrival of those refugees added to the competition for scarce resources and their resentment towards Christian population increased the intensity of violence towards the Armenians. Okay. It is in this context that a particular war will take place, the 1877 war between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans will be wiped out very quickly. And at that moment, at the beginning of 1878, the Russians are going to seize the opportunity to insert the Armenian issue in their treaty of San Stefano, as it is known, okay? And to make it uh, Article 16 of the Treaty of San Stefano, they start occupying the whole region. You see south of the border, uh, you see Tbilisi and so on, so you have Armenia, you have the square, the region from Erzurum, okay, almost to Trabizon, and to Lake Van is occupied by the Russians after the 1877 war. And in the Treaty of San Stefano, the Russian Empire is going to use the Armenian question, of course, for its own purposes, claiming that it is not going to leave these regions, okay? It will stay there until the Ottoman authorities enact reforms to solve the Armenian issues, okay? So it is taking advantage of that opportunity, as we do today, by the way, international diplomacy of, often uses issues, okay? You can go attack a country and suddenly you will find uh, the American press enamored with the rights of women in Afghanistan or something like that. We are saving the women of Afghanistan or uh, whatever it might be. And then that issue disappears three years later. Today, women are in the same mess in which they were six years ago, but it's no more trendy to deal with that issue, you know? So it disappears, it's like a miracle, you know? Issues come and go, imbeciles swallow them, and uh, that's how the world is run, you know? Uh, so 
This is how the Armenian issue became internationalized. This was the kiss of death for the Armenians. The fact that the Russians are seizing upon their issue, okay, for their own interest, of course, not for the Armenians. Okay, it's an empire, like all empires, they pursue their own interest. That issue of internationalization, as I will mention it in a few minutes after another topic, okay, will become even worse when all of the European powers are going to try to supposedly deal with the Armenian issue in the summer of 1878. Armenians will suddenly turn into a fifth column, a group of internal enemies collaborating with the Europeans, okay, those very same Europeans who have done their best since Greek independence in 1830 to dismantle the rest of the European possessions of the Ottoman Empire. Beyond the refugee problem, which was the second key factor, I have finished, I'm done with that, you have the third factor is the rejection of equality of the Tanzimat reforms. I have mentioned that in passing, and in particular of the decree of 1856, known as the Hati Humayun, the imperial rescript, promulgating equality of all Ottoman subjects, be they Armenian, as I said, uh, Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, Muslims, and so on. This was intolerable for a population that was overwhelmingly Sunni Muslim, and that was already experiencing uh, the, a process of decay, that is, for the first time realizing that their empire, which they thought was the most powerful power in the world, that's how they grew up, you know, okay, was now losing ground hmm, to the Europeans and suddenly you fall, you know, uh, you realize you are no more what you used to be. Hmm? As a result of that phenomenon, the general attitude towards Armenians worsened. And it is only at the end of the 1860s that the main body governing Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, it was your religious establishment that represented your community. So if you were a Jewish Ottoman, it was the Grand Rabbi of Istanbul or Constantinople at that time that was the official representative and go-between with the Jewish community. If you were Armenian, it was the Patriarch of Istanbul. If you were Greek, it was the Greek Patriarch of Istanbul. The Patriarch of Istanbul, Armenian one, around him had various bodies, you know, a civil council, a religious council. And these people had been living in total ignorance of what was going on in the historic heartland of the Armenians. It is only at the end of the 1860s, uh, as a result of various processes that I, won't, uh, I don't need to mention here, that the realities of the eastern provinces suddenly you know, reach Constantinople and the leadership of the Armenians. The Patriarchate organizes a commission, a committee, that basically organizes a, a kind of a, a lengthy report detailing all the cases of violence against Armenians, land usurpation, uh, uh, killing, beating, this and that. I have the reports. Uh, the first one uh, was completed in April 1872, the second one in 18, uh, September 1876, and respectfully submitted to the Sultan, asking him to take steps to remedy the situation. Those reports are a mine of information uh, because uh, they give you uh, essentially the location of the incidents. Very often, 80% of, uh, of the cases, they give you the names of the culprits and their status, you know? uh, So you can find out whether it's a sheikh or, uh, you know, the name, the location, the date. Uh, so it's extremely precise, you know? It's not some kind of hot air of uh, three pages saying 15% uh, of Armenian lands have been usurped and so on. No, it's very specific. That is, it is very easy for the Ottoman state, you know, to corroborate the whole thing. Uh, for a social historian or economic historian, it is also a mine because you see the realities there. Okay? The first question that emerges is that why wasn't there any reaction that we know of on the part of the Ottoman authorities in the 1870s to change uh, this situation in the eastern provinces? 
we need some researchers to go to the Ottoman archives uh, once uh, they are uh, truly open because they have been opened a number of times, you know, the Ottoman Empire. But the more you open them, it seems the more closed they are. So it's a bizarre phenomenon. Access to them is limited to scholars uh, who fit the mold of semi-official uh, historiography, uh, Turkish historiography. Uh, so w there are two possibilities. Either uh, the Ottoman authorities of the 1870s, who hadn't yet adopted an anti-Armenian attitude, that will come with Sultan Abdul Hamid, the next one, you know? Either they didn't have the means to intervene or didn't find it uh, useful to do it, no? because politically it, it was a region they didn't control fully and so on, or uh, they were in favor of allowing that process of dispossession and of Armenian emigration from that area to dissolve the concentration of the Armenian population. The fourth key factor in the Armenian question is the, its internationalization, which started with uh, the Treaty of San Stefano, Article 16. Not until reforms are enacted by Ottoman authorities will we withdraw from the eastern provinces, say the Russians. Immediately, the British, the French, and so on, Austro-Hungarian, are saying, gee, this is an opportunity for the Russians to pursue their goals of reaching the warm seas. You know, that's how they look at the Russians, you know. The Russians, they want to move towards the Persian Gulf or Arab Gulf. So this is another step on their part, you know. Or they want to reach the Mediterranean. So the British especially are incensed. And with the uh, intermediary being the Bismarck, the Chancellor of uh, Germany, they organize a conference in Berlin, in Germany, what became Germany, uh, in the summer of 1878, and there comes a Treaty of Berlin, putting now responsibility for the enactment of Armenian reforms on all of the European powers. And suddenly, Article 16 of the Treaty of San Stefano becomes Article 61 in the Treaty of Berlin. And as a British duke put it, what was uh, everybody's responsibility was now nobody's responsibility. So the trick is that whereas in the Treaty of San Stefano, the Russians could decide and had a means of putting pressure on the Ottomans, assuming they wanted to do it, okay, now the responsibility to solve the Armenian issue was dissolved, okay, and uh, effectively this was, again, the second kiss of death for the Armenians because the Sultan who took power at that time, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, uh, I have just finished a lengthy piece on uh, him uh, based on his memoranda and other things, uh, people who worked for him. Uh, well, not, on, not merely was he a paranoid person, but he was also radically anti-Western, uh, radically anti-Tanzimat reforms of equality, totally in favor of reasserting Islamic superiority. And he looked at that treaty as being, you know, one more step by the Europeans to dismantle the Ottoman Empire. That is, once Abdul Hamid seizes power, effectively 1877, you know, he dissolves the parliament, gets rid of the Grand Vizier and so on. Uh, this gentleman has no intention whatsoever to solve any Armenian problem. To the contrary, he wants to drive the Armenians out of the eastern provinces, to dissolve their presence there, and to relocate there as many refugees as he can put his hands on. His policy consists in consolidating and furthering the centralization of the country, reasserting Islamic superiority, promoting Islamic unity in the empire by co-opting the Kurds, and getting rid of the Tanzimat reforms in general, which he detested uh, liberally. To consolidate centralization, he needed to control the provincial notables and the tribal leaders, and he did it actually masterfully. He brought about a rapprochement between state officials and the urban notables by turning them both against Armenians. 
from 1891 on, he co-opted Sunni Kurdish tribes because there were other groups, not merely Sunni uh, Muslims. He organized them into light cavalry regiments named after himself, Hamidiye, uh, with much pomp. He turned them against the Armenian population, but also potentially against those urban notables who would resist it. Okay? The third goal of the Hamidiye was to be like the Russian Cossacks, Cossack regiments, and to patrol the Russian Ottoman border. These were the goals of that, uh, that group. Okay. By creating those Hamidiye regiments also, he split the Kurds into various groups, giving precedence to minor Sunni Muslim tribes, undermining major Sunni Muslim tribes, and turning the Sunni Muslim Kurds against Yezidi and other Kurds, because Kurds were, they, they, they had uh, some different religions. So he splintered the nascent sense of nationality based on ethnicity that was emerging among the Kurdish population of the Ottoman Empire. In 1895-96, after specific massacres in a region uh, known as Sassoun, in 1894, the Europeans started agitating themselves again. They had forgotten the Armenian question, essentially, since 1878, organizing a few meetings up to 1882, right and left, and then abandoning the issue altogether. 1894, they start agitating themselves again and saying, you have to organize reform here, you know, enact reforms. And as a result of that, a large-scale series of massacres starts throughout the Ottoman Empire, stretching from Erzurum to Trabizon to Adana to Gaziantep to Aleppo to Istanbul to Samsun. All over the place you have massacres that follow exactly the same pattern you know, you have a call of a bugle, you have Kurdish people with soldiers that are brought around the town, you have mobs attacking the market very often after the Friday prayer in Islam, Friday is the holiday, okay? The whole thing lasts about 24 hours, you know, that way it concentrates lethality, looting, killing, uh, thefts, and then burning Armenian quarters are main characteristics of those massacres. And uh, the total casualty is uh, unclear. Uh, historians put it somewhere between 150 to 300,000 Armenians uh, killed at that time with massive dispossession of properties and the destruction in particular of a uh, substantial part of the urban uh, population. Those massacres had also another goal, the transfer of property to uh, the looters, okay? Uh, and this will be another goal of the Armenian genocide. In a nutshell, I would like to interject here something that is very essential to understand, especially in the case of a Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Unlike the Holocaust, the Armenian uh, uh, genocide is preceded by several decades of sustained large-scale violence. The Holocaust is a very bizarre case, you know, because in Germany, you find almost no violence against the Jews until the Nazis arrive. You know? In the Ottoman Empire, you see about four decades or five decades you know, of sustained violence until the whole thing becomes even more radical and uh, thorough. As a result of the failure of the Europeans uh, of doing anything, as a result of the continuous violence of the land usurpation and so on, 25 years approximately after the emergence of the Armenian question and about 10 to 12 years after its internationalization, you have the formation of Armenian political parties, essentially two main parties, Hanchagyan in 85, and the Armenian Revolutionary Federation of Tashnak Sutun in 1890. These parties became major irritants for the Sultan, Abdul Hamid II. Uh, he refers to them as anarchists. Uh, he gets in touch with the uh, Russian Tsar about them because both of them are emperors. Keep that in mind, even though enemies. And uh, what they don't like is socialists. I mean, you can be an Orthodox Christian Russian Tsar, or you can be a Sunni Muslim Ottoman, you know, Sultan, 
but when you hear the word socialism, you go berserk. You know, these are the ultimate uh, danger. So they are referred to as socialists, and indeed both organizations, especially the Hunchagians, were uh, hardline Marxists. The Tashnaks, uh, Tashnak Tsutyun were uh, mild socialists overall, even though some of them were more socialists than others, but it was a mixture, but with a socialist agenda and uh, phraseology. Okay. Uh, only the second party, the Tashnak Tsutyun, will emerge as a main player after 1896 in the Ottoman Empire. For various reasons, the Hunchakians will weaken uh, after 1895-96 and uh, will split also into two uh, after that time. Why am I mentioning this phenomenon? Because Ab Abdul Hamid's anti-Armenian policies which started around 1882, turned into massacre in 94, into large-scale massacres in 95, 96, uh, uh, were also justified, in his mind at least, okay, for the large-scale massacre by the emergence of Armenian political parties. But those parties were not parties that claimed independence and so on. They were the result of 25 years of inaction, Ottoman inaction, regarding the situation of the Armenians. And here I have uh, finished my uh, overall background and we are going to move into the second part that is the Young Turks specifically. The Young Turks are revolutionaries. They want to modernize the Ottoman Empire and they seize power as a result of a coup d'etat because they had infiltrated the officer corps, people sitting in Macedonia, in Greece, Northern Greece. So they organize a coup d'etat, seize power in 1908 but keep the Ottoman Sultan in place until 1909. Uh, usually, the Armenian genocide is carried out by the Young Turks. But what has to be understood is that the Young Turks inherited a particular situation from the policies of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. They didn't create the situation, they inherited it. Okay? The Young Turks is a generic term what we are referring to is a particular par party known as the Committee of Union and Progress. That was the ruling party. Okay. That party was faced with a particular problem. It had no solid presence in the eastern provinces and it wanted to co-opt the same notables and Kurdish leaders that had been co-opted by Sultan Abdul Hamid II. In a nutshell, those young Turks had very little incentives of enacting any reforms regarding the Armenian question, even though they were on extremely friendly terms with the leading Armenian political party, the, the Tashnak Tsutyun, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. Okay. Those young Turks also were a kind of fascinating double-faced bunch, their top leadership. There are studies uh, by a uh, br brilliant uh, Turkish scholar teaching at Princeton. His name is uh, Shukri Haniolu. He has published two volumes on the uh, Young Turks from their origins to 1908. He doesn't want to go on because then he would have to deal with uh, massacres and uh, I invited him to Berkeley. He was a bit uh, reluctant to write the third volume. Uh, but what he has revealed in those two first volumes is uh, remarkable because he has access to the private writings of those leaders. As early as 1904 or 5, that is before coming to power, the top young Turk leaders have been, I would say, uh, shaped by European positivism. They are unbelievers. They don't give a penny about Islam or any religion, which they look as instruments to poison imbecile, stupid muscles. So they associate religion with, you know, the opium of the people. Okay, that's, that's good for the peasants and so on. They are stupid, but, you know, these are people who believe in changing society by force through their own will. And these are people now who have been exposed to those ideas that were very trendy at the end of the 19th century in Europe, because many of them, Dr. Nazem, Dr. Behaeddin Shakir, have been educated in Europe. These are doctors. And they have been exposed to the idea of race and racism. And they have come up with the idea that there is a Turkish race, 
and that the main plight of the Ottoman Empire is that, you know, it, you have all kinds of people, and because of Islam, there hasn't come about a real ruling class, ethnically homogeneous ruling class. They say the Tanzimat has failed, Sultan Abdul Hamid's Islamism has failed because the Arabs now, they are growing restless also. The Kurds, they don't really like Turks, even though they have collaborated with Sultan Abdul Hamid. What is left is the Turkish core of the empire, they say. And those people reach power in 1908, and they are faced with further territorial losses, in particular the Balkan Wars of 1912-13, where they lose the rest of their European territories, northern Greece and so on. All that is gone and another two million refugees flock into Anatolia. And there they see the opportunity of transforming Anatolia, which is the only area where Turkish people still constitute a solid majority. Not all over the place, but overall. Outside Anatolia, once you reach Cilicia already, okay, Turks are not in the majority. Okay? You reach northern Syria, Aleppo, and so on, Turks are a minuscule minority. Arabs are the majority. So they envision a nation state based on Turkish people who are going to be the owners of that nation, the leaders of that nation, and anybody else, you know, has to be either excluded or fully subjected. <coughs> this is their ideology. It's a secretive pyramidal organization with very few changes in its top leadership from the 1890s to their very end in 1918 when they flee the Ottoman Empire. They are organized like the 19th century revolutionary parties that led to the Bolsheviks in Russia and so on. It's a similar type of organization, okay? But with an ideology and an agenda that is essentially, you know, had European historians known more a little bit about the Middle East, you can find the origins of fascism, Italian-style fascism, already in the Young Turk movement. Okay, in its organization, is recourse to violence, intimidation, uh, sense of megalomaniac superiority of a particular group of people, and so on. You, 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 you have it all in the uh, literature. I, I am talking already too much, but I wanted to bring you many quotations of their theoreticians. At their Congress of 1911, they adopt a very clearly, now openly, semi-openly, because the European consuls become aware of it, but not all Ottomans, they adopt officially as party policy a policy of crushing minorities if need be, as a Turkish famous historian who is re referred to as the dean of the study of the Young Turk period, Hikmet Bayur, put it, the tendency to see issues of national unity and, and so on as simply problems to be solved by military force gradually became the line of the party. You know. So the decision is that we'll, you know, uh, we'll do it, but outside that meeting, their position is that we are Ottomanist. This is the Ottoman Empire. We are all Ottoman brothers, whether you are Armenian, you are Jewish, you are Arab, you are Kurdish, we are all brothers. We are Ottoman citizens. So they have two faces, an internal position and the external uh, position. The relations between those people and the Armenian party, Tashnak Sutun, were cordial. That's the irony of the whole thing. From 1908 up to 1912, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the main Armenian party in the Ottoman Empire, systematically voted with the Young Turks in Parliament, collaborated with them, had informal discussions with them starting in 1910, and in 1911 those discussions became formal because the leaders of the Tashnak Tsun realized that their friends, the Young Turks, were doing nothing in the eastern provinces, were not returning land, were not arresting culprits, and that what was happening under Abdul Hamid was outright continuing. No? 
In 1909, indeed, I mentioned it in passing, a massive wave of massacre takes place in the region of Adana here, stretching from Adana to Hajun, Gardian Tep. Hajun is not on the map, okay? About 20, 25,000 Armenians are killed in particular circumstances, and the young Turks do nothing to arrest the culprits. Actually, they nominate the main guy responsible for them as the head of the relief commission to, uh, his name is Baghdad Le, uh, to uh, take care of the victims of the massacre. Despite that event, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation continues its friendship with the Young Turks and gets involved in negotiations. And it is only in 1912, in August of 1912, that realizing that nothing was coming out of those negotiations, the Tashnak Tutun finally adopts a position of neutrality in parliament. And along with the Armenian Patriarchate of Constantinople, and the Armenian Patriarch and the Armenian Catholicos of Echmiadzin in Russia, then, you know, near Yerevan. Okay, you have there the head of the Armenian Church is near Yerevan in a place known as Echmiadzin. So the Patriarchate of Constantinople, the Catholicos of Yerevan, the Tashnak Tsutun decide that there is no solution. The Young Turks are doing nothing to the contrary. The Adana culprits, you know, they are doing just fine. Armenians are leaving the eastern provinces. Many of them are even going to America, those who have money and so on. And prodded by the Russians, you know, they try to internationalize the problem, the Armenian problem again, to put pressure on the Young Turks to enact reforms. The Russians, whose agenda it was precisely to do that, take advantage of those distraught Armenians and knock at the door of the Austro-Hungarians, the French, the British, the Germans, and so on. And for two years almost, a year and a half, you have negotiations among those powers, which in February 1914 leads to the conclusion of a treaty known as the Reform Act, whereby that Reform Act is thrust upon the Ottoman authorities, the Young Turks. It's not that they are delighted with it. The European powers agree for the first time since 1878 that something has to be done. And they decide that two inspector generals, Europeans, one Norwegian, one Dutch, are going to be sent to the eastern provinces. The word Armenia is not used in that document. Those eastern provinces are going to be divided into two areas, each one with an inspector general that guy will have full rights to enact reforms and in particular will create mixed gendarmeries with Armenians and Turks and personally will supervise the restitution of land and the arrest of the culprits in case of assassinations and various other things. No sooner had that act finally been concluded and the inspector generals had reached one of them Istanbul, the other one was getting close to the eastern provinces, then the First World War starts in the summer of 1914, and the leadership of the Young Turks signs a treaty with the Germans, sides with the Germans against the Entente powers, the British, the French, and the Russians, okay? And Hopefully, in order to be helpful, you have to realize that most genocides take place in time of war. That is, war is, looks as if it is one of the most opportune uh, circumstances to carry out a genocide. Almost all of them, you know, none of them is taking place in a, when everything is fine and somebody decides, gee, what about massacring my neighbors here, you know? Uh, the weather is good, I feel like it, I have been feeling like it for a while. You know, uh, now is the time. No, usually you need particular circumstances because then you don't have foreign intervention. You have mobilized your forces, your secret service, the army. Maybe males have been expedited to the boundaries, the borders to fight. You have a population that is already emasculated with Armenian males in the Ottoman army, you know. So it's very easy to take care of the business, okay? 
The second thing that very often is typical of genocide is that they take place in at the very least authoritarian, if not totalitarian regimes. The Ottoman, the Young Turk regime after the coup d'etat of January 1913, they were dislodged from government for about seven, eight months in 1912, at the end of 1912. 1913, January, they come back to power with a coup d'etat. They assassinate the prime minister, Grand Vizier, Shevket, Mahmoud Shevket Pasha. And then you have a real authoritarian regime being installed you know, in the Ottoman Empire with no opposition left. The parliament is a dummy body you know, that is totally irrelevant. There is one party and there is something else. So genocides, war, authoritarian regimes, if not totalitarian, okay? These are good things for a genocide to take place. The third thing that is very good, okay, is uh, something that I have just forgotten, I think. That must be a very good one. Single party, party state regimes. Okay, party state. The Ottoman Empire had a government in 1914, 1915, when the genocide was decided and started being carried out. But the real decision making for all important matters was taking place in the central committee of the Committee of Union and Progress. In the party, the Grand Vizier, the Prime Minister of the Ottoman Empire, was not fully aware of the secret treaty signed by Enver Pasha with the Germans leading to the Ottoman Empire joining Germany in the First World War. Can you imagine that? I mean, the Prime Minister is not fully aware of what's going on. The Prime Minister, again, okay, was not fully aware of the decision to exterminate Armenians. That decision was taken by the Central Committee, but you see there is overlapping between the Central Committee and the government. The strong man of the Central Committee, Talat Pasha, is also the interior minister in the government. The second strong man, Enver Pasha, is the defense minister, okay? In addition to being a top general of an army, you know? Uh, okay. So it's not that they are totally separate in the Central Committee. You have individuals who are sitting in both. Hmm? But the real body deciding things, like in the Soviet Union, it's not the government of the Soviet Union, you know? It's a Politburo. And at times, in Stalin's time, it's Stalin overall. You know? And maybe one or two of his buddies. It's not even the whole of the Politburo. Okay? So this is the type of regime, uh, the type of circumstances that seems to be conducive to uh, the planning of a genocide, envisioning a genocide, an ideology of exclusion. Nazi ideology was the most radical one among those. A racist ideology uh, with a sense of megalomania. It's, you know, I don't have time to refer to some of the Ottoman texts, but it's magnificent. They are envisioning an empire of Turkic people. <coughs> it has two forms, a minimal empire, they say, from Lake Baikal to Norway, okay? Turkey, a maximum empire which will stretch from the Sea of Japan, okay, to the Baltics. So these are the two versions of the empire they are envisioning. And it has to be Turkic, and it will be led, they say, by a Saib Karan. This was the title given to Timur Leng in the 14th century, the lord of the conjunction of the stars. That's what it means in classical Ottoman, okay? That is by a supreme leader. It's going to be led by a supreme leader, charismatic supreme leader who will be a military leader. The idea was Enver Pasha, okay? Uniting all the Turkic people of that area. Combined with that, you have the bitter resentment against the Europeans, who are portrayed as a bunch of losers, you know, that need to be crushed, put in their place. The hatred, you know, because for 150 years they have lost ground and ground, you know, and now is the time to show them what we can do. Okay? So, ideology, war, particular type of political organization, especially party state type of places, 
and overall authoritarian, totalitarian regime. These are key components you know, of most uh, genocidal uh, cases you will find. In addition to that, a second ideology emerged in, after 1911 and became the main ideology in 1930. It was known as Mili Iktisad. That means in Ottoman national economy. That ideology was also borrowed from German thinkers, Friedrich List in particular. Okay? What was Mili Iktisad? The argument went thus. In order to have a nation state, it was said, you need to have a bourgeoisie, a middle class, that belongs to the dominant ethno-racial racial group. You cannot have a nation state, let's say Turkey, and its bourgeoisie, its middle class, or upper middle class will be Armenian, Jewish, you know, and Greek. Okay? And they give you examples. They tell you that the kingdom of Poland failed in the 18th century because, you know, it didn't have Polish middle class and so on. So there you go. So in addition to the national project of creating a Turkey in what is left, that is what we know now as being Turkey, the idea is that it's not enough to have that piece of land fully inhabited by Turks. You also need, in order to have a real state, you also need a Turkish middle class. Unfortunately for them, in 1914, there is a state survey which shows that Turks barely control 15 to 20% of the economy. The bulk of the economy, about 40% so far as I remember, is Greek, another 25% Armenian, some Jewish, you know, and the Turks are in nothing. Mili Iktisad is, that, is the idea that you have to create a bourgeoisie that is ethnically homogeneous and belongs to the ruling racial group. And the Armenian genocide, the extermination of the Ar Armenian genocide, the killing and driving out of the Greeks will be the opportunity through looting and transfer of property to create indeed a Turkish middle class. Let me give you one example. One of the um, billionaires of Turkey is Mr. Sabanje. He was a brilliant man. He created the Sabanje Holding, which presumably is one of the two largest companies in uh, holding holdings in Turkey. The founder of that uh, huge uh, wealth, Mr. Sabanje, wrote his memoirs in Turkish. They were published about 15 years ago. That's when I uh, got them. I believe they might be even translated into English. In it, he mentions that his wealth started with, uh, I think it was a cotton mill or something like that that was confiscated from Armenians in the region of Cilicia. That's how he started. He had nothing, no? Most of the people who benefited from that transfer of property failed. I have also comments by American consuls and so on laughing. They are saying, you know, you don't become a trader by killing a trader. That is by killing Armenians, taking their property. That doesn't mean you are going to be as efficient. Okay? Huh? Uh, so they are laughing at those new rich, you know, new wealthy of the Ottoman Empire. Sabanje, you know, was an able man. He started with that and some land and made it into a huge holding, multi-billion dollar holding. So the Turkish middle class was established on the base of minority wealth and that process continued even in the, the Second World War when Jews, Greeks and Armenians were imposed a particular tax known as Varlık Verdisi in 1943, extortionary tax, to take over their money Jews, Armenians, and Greeks were sent to concentration camp, not exactly the, the Nazi type of killing, but no, very bad place in Erzurum, freezing to death with very little food, okay? Their properties seized because supposedly they had to contribute to the Turkish war effort. The only problem is that Turkey was neutral at that time and very close to Germany, actually, okay? It waited until the last day to declare war against Germany. Uh, so that practice of, uh, as it is known in uh, political science, of predatory state that can turn against target groups, usually particular ethnic groups or things, has, is something that went on and it took place again with the pogroms against the Greeks in Istanbul in 
1955. And here I will cut it short. The precipitate, because I was said one hour, I think people are getting tired, I'm getting tired, everybody wants to sleep now, so, you know, I shouldn't prevent that sleep deprivation, you heard it, it's pretty bad, you know, they did it to some people, uh, it's no good. Uh, you know, not everybody can kill dozens of people. It takes a particular type of uh, people to enjoy killing or to watch killing. There is a remarkable speech by Himmler, you know, to the SS, I believe it was. You know, I, uh, I used to use it to comment, you know, the film in, uh, at UCLA when I was a teaching fellow, okay, where he's giving a speech and saying, I think that uh, it was to the SS, that, you know, it takes really superior people like you, people who believe in the national cause, eh, to carry out such a magnificent work, you know, seeing dead Jews day in, day out, the smell, the, the, the thing. I mean, it takes superior people. There is a pride in a job well done. In the Ottoman Empire, the type of people who were similar to the SS was a secret organization known as the Teshkilati Masusa. In Ottoman, it's special organization. It had a military wing, it had a paramilitary wing. The paramilitary wing was led by two members of the Central Committee, of the Committee of Union and Progress, Dr. Nazim and Dr. Behaeddin Shakir. One located in Erzurum, the other one in Trabzon. These were the two centers. Okay. These are the people who carried out first the butchery around cities of young boys, 15, 14, who weren't yet in the army, you know, or older men, 45, 50, okay? and then the massive deportations of the rest of the population okay, to the deserts of Syria and Mesopotamia in areas where you can't survive. And we now have documents by Talat Pasha, the main uh, leader of the Young Turks, referring to some other agenda a year earlier and saying that uh, nobody can survive in that area. A year later, precisely, that's where he is sending our meetings. We have a dissertation by a young Kurdish scholar in France that shows that the whole thing, I mean, the, the intent is blatant, you know? Okay. That special organization, that type of killer, it can be the KGB in the Soviet Union for various things. It can be uh, the SSs. It can be the Teshkilati Masusa. You need that type of individual, you know, uh, combining a kind of fanaticism with ruthlessness. Uh, maybe in the case of the Teshkilati Masusa, they took killers out of jail to put them in the organization because uh, there was a manual dimension in the butcheries around cities, a kind of hands-on approach to killing, a little bit like the Rwanda case. No? Uh, so uh, that was the organization that carried out those policies. 1914, what the Young Turk leaders do is detailed surveys of ethnic groups in the Eastern Anatolia. Every single tribal group or ethnic group, Alevi, Yezidi, uh, Armenians, they have sent people to describe where they live, how many there are, what their relations are with one another. This guy is Turk, Kurdish, uh, Yezidi. The other one is Sunni. This one belongs to the tribe of Batman. The other one of something else. Okay. They have led the foundation for a detailed knowledge of the area which they are going to Turkify and Islamize. Okay? We have now some of those things uh, uh, published. The main ideologue of the Young Turks writes a lengthy report. We still don't have the copy. We know of its existence by Turkish sources. That is not Armenian sources. His name is Zia Gökalp. He is in charge of finding a solution to the Armenian question. He writes the report. Okay? It must be somewhere in the Ottoman archives. Inshallah, one day they will be fully opened and we'll read it. The key trigger in this general context of polarization of the influx of about 2 million Turkic people from the Balkans after the Balkan Wars of 1912-13 flocking into Istanbul on carts with uh, 
bugs, uh, they have lost everything. Some of those people were already twice refugees prior to that. Some were from Russia, had been, had been turned into refugees in the 1860s, had ended up in Bulgaria. Bulgaria proclaimed independence, had ended up in Macedonia. Macedonia is lost, now they end up in Istanbul and elsewhere. And they have to be relocated. The Ottomans, their agenda is to spread to Central Asia, as I told you, that large empire or the minimal empire. The leader, one of the two leaders, Enver Pasha, member of the Central Committee and chief of the army, decides to attack Russia to link with his Azeri brother. You see Azerbaijan to the right there, okay? And he does it in the middle of winter, end of December 1940. And he is faced with a catastrophic defeat at the end of 1914 at Sarakamish, where he loses about 85-87% of his troops, not to the Russians, to freezing conditions, because he has no logistics, no clothing, no nothing. He comes back to Istanbul, puts the blame for what happened to him on the Armenians. February 24, 1915, and I am reaching the last point, you have the British, Australians, and others who decide to give a deadly blow to the Ottoman Empire by envisioning an attack on Gallipoli, the Straits. Hmm? That is to go straight to the heart of the Ottoman Empire. The idea is that if they can land there, they will destroy the capital, take over. The young Turk leaders have already decided to flee to Eskisheir inland to move their capital inside, okay? The first, the Navy appears in that area on February the 25th, British boats, ship. The decision to carry out the Armenian genocide took place in a meeting of the Central Committee. We know it on the base of Turkish sources. We know the decision was not unanimous, but was taken by the strong men of the committee. That means Enver, Talat, Shakir, Dr. Nazim, at the very least, okay? Uh, it was taken at a time when Behaeddin Shakir, who had started carrying out such policies, one source said, was back from Eastern Anatolia. So that's the key thing for the time. This means it was at the end of February 1915 or early March 1915 that a definitive, clear meeting took place deciding the enactment of the Armenian Genocide. That is here, if I draw a parallel with the Holocaust, where up to now we don't have one document showing a clear, you know, order that today, uh, let's say, uh, June 26, 1941, or December 22, 1941, or whatever, you know, uh, we are deciding we are going to carry out the final solution. By this, uh, we mean the ausrottung of all Jews and so on. We're going to get rid of them uh, once and forever, wherever we are. No, we don't have one single document. There, there is more and more historians, as we know, you know, there have been debates for uh, 20 years, and the general thing is like they, there is a clear progression. The more they move eastward, Poland, Russia, and so on, the more radicalization, local killing, and then systematic uh, killings with the building of the concentration camps and killing camps uh, uh, later on. In the case of the Armenian, in the Armenian case, we know that there is a clear meeting, and it's by a very important source, we know that, and it's ratified by an unrelated Turkish source also, okay? Central Committee decision. The date is not absolutely clear, even though uh, I am confident we'll find it. It's end of February 1915 or early March 19. 15, and after that, the implementation is carried out in Cilicia around Zeytun at the end of March 1915. So it's consistent with what we see, and then it spreads to Istanbul with the arrest of all the Armenian elite in April the 24th. This is the context of 
The Armenian Genocide is part of the birth certificate of the modern Turkish Republic. And that's the argument. Both in the formation of a nation state, from the perspective of the formation of a modern nation state, the perspective of the formation of a Turkish bourgeoisie, in terms of the continuity of the political elite between the Ottoman and early Mustafa Kemal period. The Mustafa Kemal, if you don't know it, is the founder of modern Turkey. He has the title of Atatürk, father of the Turks. There are two Dutch studies by a remarkable professor, Ernst Zürcher, no? uh, who have established the remarkable continuity, that is that the top leadership around Mustafa Kemal came from the young Turks, many of whom had first-hand uh, uh, played a first-hand role in exterminating Armenians. Not Mustafa Kemal himself. We have no evidence about it. One of the Turkish presidents up to the 60s, Jelal Bayar, was one of the leaders of the Teshkilat i Masusa. That is, yes, he's a first-hand killer. Not uh, he was a young Turk, thus he is responsible. He was a leader, regional leader of the Teshkilat i Masusa, Okay, involved in exterminating and deporting Armenians. <laughs> Ismet Inonu, the second president after Mustafa Kemal, was also Teshkilati Masusa. Okay, and I won't name all the others, they are relevant. There is continuity between what happened in the Ottoman Empire and the Atatürk regime, and this is why it's very difficult for Turks who have been exposed to a totally fake historiography about a break between the Ottoman Empire and the newborn, like a phoenix, Turkish Republic, okay? All that is a series of lies, and the uh, denial of the Armenian genocide is part of those lies, that it is embedded in that fake historiography that has emerged. Final comment. The denial of the Armenian genocide officially starts in 1916 with the publication of a volume in Ottoman about the activities of Armenian revolutionary parties and so on. That is, they try to say Armenian revolutionaries were organizing a revolution. We had to do something. Unfortunately, things went a bit poorly, but it's not genocide. But the Armenian genocide, when you read the Turkish memoirs of the people who participated in and that is typical, it's like Himmler, the, the speech I was referring to. It is with great pride that they are justifying what they did. Two of them were doctors. One of them said, I'm a doctor, but first of all, I'm a Turk. You know? To me, to save the nation is the greatest glory that, can, that I can contribute to, to Turkishness. Uh, that is, in the very early period, until the early 1920s, these people, the events were not only widely known, but the people who had carried out those events were very pride, proud of what they had done. It was a badge of honor for them. They had saved uh, the nation, uh, and that's how uh, things go with genocide. And thank you for your patience. I thought my lecture would be short, but it's a little bit longer, I guess. Eh?